excuse me, you are muted. We can't hear anything. Oh, all good now. See? Uh, better? Okay. Um, so we also have wellness walks, we have full moon walks, and nature journaling. So a lot of fun things, and more things are going to come up on the website soon as we add our summer catalog. Uh, so the Burbathon is back. So this year, uh, so we do this every single year around this time and the birds are really starting to come back to our area. Um, and so this year it's gonna be a month long time where you can choose one day, a 24 hour period to go to Yank Hour either by yourself or with a group and count however many birds, uh, both species and individuals that you see in a 24 hour time frame. So whoever counts the most during that 24, their chosen 24 hour time frame wins. So it's always really fun and a really good way to see uh, what birds are in our area. Um, and this, uh, we hope that people kind of do it. Different groups will do it throughout May so we can really see when the birds are coming through our area. Um, and our native plant sale. So we have one in the spring and the fall every year. And um, so the Monarch Alliance is the main group that does it. So that's our little, uh, we have a committee basically that's the Monarch Alliance. Uh, so we team up with them to do this native plant sale. And it will actually open tomorrow at 5 p.m. online. So we have pre-orders. So that makes sure that you get your plants and the makes pick up super easy, where you just go to the back and they get your plants get loaded into your car. Uh, but we also have an in-person sale as well as a pickup on June 1st. So if you miss out on the pre-sale, there's gonna be more plants that are available during the, the in-person sale as well. So don't miss out on that. All right, and lastly, this ties all together, but we are happy to announce the Monarch Alliance has a new logo. Um, so the last one was a little more, is it a Monarch? Is it not? Uh, so this one is definitely a Monarch. So um, Gus, one of our former AmeriCorps service members actually designed this. Um, and so this is the first time it's ever being shown. It's not even on our website yet. So you are all the first to see it. Um, and so with that, I'm going to introduce Dave, who's the chair of the Monarch Alliance. He's going to tell you a little bit more about the Monarch Alliance. Hello. My name is Dave Martz. I drew the short straw. That's why I'm <laughs> the chair. Um, the Monarch Alliance is the local group, and we're under the Potomac Valley Audubon Society. Uh, nationally, they have the Monarch Watch, and they have the Monarch Joint Venture with both, up, both of those groups educating the public on the, on the monarch and basically the movement of the monarch into the winter uh, areas into Mexico. Um, as far as locally, we take volunteers. The, our main group, our goal is to uh, just educate people on the monarch. It's also, we have grants available for the nonprofit schools, churches, any like private, uh, like Qantas club type things. And we have applications. Those are online at the PBAS site and they open up typically towards the fall. And then the committee I'm on, we vote for who, who we select. We typically select three people and they do get up to like a thousand dollars worth of plants. The plants they get, if they're, if they're awarded one of the grants are picked up at the spring flower show. So if you apply this year with a group you will get it next spring at, at the uh, store where all the plants are sold. But other than that, that's about it for me. We have about uh, maybe 10 people on the committee set right now. So it's pretty much it. So thank you. <laughs> so my name is Laurel. I also work for the Potomac Valley Audubon Society, and I have the lovely pleasure of introducing Valerie. Um, so yeah, anytime Val and I are together, and we've been able to spend a lot of time together because I've come over for watershed field trips at Cacapen, and she's helped me host there. Um, our conversation inevitably leads to monarchs because they make us both just so excited and so passionate about what we do. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read her bio. So Valerie Cheney is currently the Park Naturalist Park Activities Coordinator at Cacapen Resort State Park in Berkeley Springs, West Virginia. She's a West Virginia native of Fort Ashby located in Mineral County. 
She's been with West Virginia State Parks since 2018, managing the Parks Nature Center and developing activities, youth programs, guided hikes, and interpretive programs for all ages. As a park naturalist, she covers a wide range of environmental topics, but monarch butterfly conservation has taken the lead. It certainly has. The original mowed lawn surrounding the nature center has transformed over the years into a beautiful oasis of native plants for all pollinators and is an official monarch way station by Monarch Watch. And if you haven't uh, had a chance to go visit it, you absolutely should because it is a beautiful garden. Working with volunteer groups, monarch conservation groups, and local community groups has made all this possible. She's received grants to design and purchase plants for the Monarch Way Station and interpretive signs. Those grants are through the Blue Ridge Wild Ones, the Monarch Alliance, the Eastern West Virginia Community Foundation. The Monarch Way Station has become an outdoor classroom for all to see varieties of milkweed, monarchs in all life stages, helping our visitors discover how they can make a difference. And this year was <clears throat> their most successful year yet of raising monarchs and tagging them on site with visitors and with the local Morgan County schools. So with that, I'll give it over to Val. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Well, awesome to be here tonight. So again, I'm Valerie Chaney, Park Naturalist at the Cape and Resort State Park. So if you haven't been, I invite you there. Um, so tonight, tonight's topic, of course, is the monarchs. Um, and we'll be talking about um, their natural their natural phenomenon of what they're able to do. This small insect that weighs half of a gram can travel two to 3,000 miles all the way to Mexico, nowhere to go after four generations. It's the great, 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 no, just the great grandkids of the, of the uh, initial ones that had gone last year. So with that phenomenon, um, I like to share, this will be my journey with you over um, my starting point at the Cape Inn and the first six years that have led up to now going to Mexico. So I just feel I wanna take you on the journey tonight um, it's it's going to be basic knowledge, but I feel like the pictures and the videos you'll you'll get a taste of Mexico here, and uh, and I'll share with you who I went with. But again, just thank you for your time for coming out tonight. And uh, at the end, I feel we'll, we'll open that up to questions. Um, but every time I you know this is an ongoing learning process. So one thing I learned just ask the next question to the next question. How's this? Happen? How's this? Happen? So so I'm grateful to be here, and this was my trip to. Um, so when I traveled was February 11th to 17th this past winter. And so I would like to thank the Monarch Alliance uh, specifically and the Potomac Valley Audubon Society for, for sharing with me a, um, a, a travel educational grant, a partial one to help get there. So I really appreciate you all and your, and your organization. Um, absolutely. And on the right here, so who I travel with is Natural Habitat Adventures. So, and I know uh, they have a lot of different travel groups to basically all all countries. I am I'm just floored with their um, expert guides that are that are provided on your trips. So look them up if you want to travel to any country. Look them up. They team up with WWF. A lot of that money goes back to local tourism for wherever you're traveling to. And then I I got lucky. So here I'm sure you all knew Tess do. Um, so Tess. We started to look at travel groups, and she came across Monarch Joint Venture was was traveling with Natural Habitat this winter. So I was lucky enough to get on one of three of the trips. So I felt th this was just icing on the cake because it would have been fun to go with just any any enthusiast anywhere. But these were Monarch educators, um, not not all from Monarch Joint Venture, but I happened to go with the program director, a lucked out big time, and then other. People on my trip, I feel the community of this trip, uh, friends from, you know, I have a state park service, there was federal, there was fish and wildlife, there were there were um, nonprofits on the group, there were there were people that just loved monarchs, um, you know, so so any of the above, it was a small 13 person travel group, and it was quite amazing. So that's the team. So this is life before monarchs. <laughs> so this is right when I first got to the Nature Center, uh, 2018, and then um, so this is before. But this is it. So that's a lot. That that's a lot better. So the biodiversity, and we're not only planning for monarchs, but it's for all pollinators. And um, this is just um, such a fun operation. I've got I've got my uh, colleague here in the crowd, Alan, and you'll. 
I will be in some videos tonight. Uh, but this is it. So if you plant it, there, um, all your pollinators will come. Uh, so then after after working with multiple people, this is behind the building. So the behind the building over here, uh, that was um, just, just before and after. Now on the side of the building, this is my favorite spot. I feel like this, this is the spot right here. So this is all about three different types of monarchs. I do all, a lot of my surveys from just right at this patch. I feel it's my favorite patch of milkweed and boom, it was, it was bare. So I feel like this has just transformed us. And uh, all, all the educational programs we're able to do because of this, this is a Girl Scout program. We do all the, a lot of local Morgan County school either come to us now. Uh, we, we started to go into schools and do monarch programs and um, that's just beautiful. So it all started with the Blue Ridge Wild Ones was a local chapter out of the Berkeley Springs area, and they helped with the initial the, um, initial front part of the nature center. So they were the they they were my original ones. If anybody knows Joyce Morningstar, she was part of that group or um, Dixie Mullinex. But I think that chapter is dissolving right now. So step two is then what Dave was just talking about. So um, so I applied through the Monarch Alliance and got the Monarch Way Station Grant. So this is all of us. We just picked up our plants. What's the nursery again, Dave? Um, sunny, sunny Meadows. Sunny Meadows. So, uh, so we got that. And so this is everyone planning along the side, along the back to, to just to get to where it is today. That was, I believe, 2020. So. And then our last um, our last grant was uh, Eastern West Virginia Community Foundation, Two Rivers Giving Circle, and these signs um, I was just so excited about. Um, there's one in the front garden, one in the back garden, and a double panel. And so the, this one had the native plants, and then on the other panel talks about all the pollinators that attracts. And the back garden right now, uh, we just put up our one about uh, milkweed and the types of milkweed. And then the switch out sign will do more September, which talks about Where's all you know? Where where are these monarchs going? So yeah, and another another um, amazing venture. So this right here, this is on the wall here, monarch right there. <laughs> um, but this was a project, our first ever artist in residence at, at our at our state park system. So she spent about a week with us um, uh, prepping this panel, and it was really cool because she she did most of the panel, but all of this work down here. We did this several weeks with our with our local community, with our with our park visitors, and we released the panel on Earth Day 2021, I think it was. So this is pretty cool. So if you come and visit, you'll see this. Um, I love it. So we'll um, we'll just start with the basic monarch life cycle. Um, so um, right there, this whole life cycle is just around a month. So in three to five days, larva. 11 to 18. Usually I chop that up to two weeks. Chrysalis, about two weeks. So this whole generation of one, two, and three, we're not migrating yet, live about one month and the adult, two to six weeks. And that depends on weather. That depends on everything. So their most important goal is to mate, lay eggs, and then their life expectancy is, is, is finished. So this really helps me start to understand what's happening um, so that with the life expectancy of generation one, two, and three. So four, four is the ones that are going to Mexico and back that they're called the super generation that was six to eight months. So let's uh, check this out real quick. So here we are. So last fall's monarchs that we tagged. Um, I haven't got, so we had about 31 monarchs. So this is the fall. They, 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 I went to see them. They, they were in the winter in the site of Mexico. And they had just now laying their eggs and they left um, mid, probably about by the second week of March and are laying their eggs mid April. So their first eggs are all being laid probably about right there. And that's the children of the fourth generation. So these are their kids, generation one and generation one, two, and three. So looking at this, this map over here. So again, um, are, are, are the ones born in late fall here are going to be starting to migrate. Our our top migration is mid mid September right here in this area. <laughs> oh, we're going to get to that. <laughs> we're going to get to the fun stuff. But I just wanted to make sure that we're um, preparing for you know how how we add those months together. So 
So when they migrate and on this phenomenal migration of four generations, two to 3,000 miles to get there, okay, um, it probably is taking about around and about, we'll just share about two months to get to Mexico. Then they're going to overwinter during some of the coldest, coldest months of Mexico and migrate there. So that's where they're getting that six to eight months of the super generation. So I just want to, because that took me a while to sink in. And again, first, second, third, where is first ones? So right now, the overwintering ones are laying their eggs probably in northern Mexico, Texas, absolutely. So Texas milkweed are warmer than us. So, so, so their milkweed back in late March, April was already probably where ours is right now. So that first generation, what they're meant to do, that generation one, two, and three is to make up whatever they lost on their way back or on their way there. So we're declined 59%. But just so um, that map really explains. Um, so the, the common milkweed, so um, you have to find out, so we're all from the area. So this would be common swamp milkweed and butterfly weed. I'd say three of the most common. There's a couple other common, but if we were in Texas, that would change. If we were out on um, the Rocky Mountains, that would change, but these are ours. Mm -hmm. So guidelines for a monarch way station. Um, so um, there are no size limits, um, but this real quick, I'll, I'll just go over it real quick, is that you have to have two different types of milkweed. So pick your favorite two, local, and then plants that bloom every season. So um, something that blooms in spring, summer, and fall. So right now, when they're trying to migrate, you probably want to have heavily on the fall asters with the golden rods, and that's when they're migrating through. So, but you have to have spring, and especially Texas, but um, I haven't seen eggs up here unless earliest I've seen eggs is in late June. So, yeah. And this is all through, so I went through the Monarch Alliance, and the Monarch Alliance teams up with, this is Monarch Joint Venture. So, so doing my official Monarch Way Station at the park, we have we have this on the fence. We have our certificate at, at a, um, the Cape and State Park Nature Center. So, so this is a first. So who here has watched a raise of hands has got to see a Monarch Lane Ames? Awesome, okay. This was my last, last summer was, was, was my first summer. So here's two videos. Uh, short clips, and either one, and I'll point to where she's laying. Sorry, one moment. I didn't know that. Nope. <laughs> that didn't work. That didn't work. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, you can click on, like, right down there. Yeah, click on that one. You have yeah. to Okay. Yeah. And, okay, there she is. I should probably just leave one right there. I'm going to zoom in here. So, right there. That would have been one. You don't see the one. And then she's just dipping her abdomen right there, the way one at a time. And I'll zoom in, and that, and that little egg right there. Other day, if we double flip that, that'll be a little bit. Um, bigger. This one, right? And see how her wings are so tattered. She is towards her end of her life expectancy. But that's, and we watched, we watched this happen. Alan. <laughs> We were so excited this day. We watched her eggs for hours and then went, went home. And then the next day, we did an official survey of Monarch Joint Venture and we counted about 28 eggs. Um, mm -hmm. Took about three and a half hours to count. Um, so, these are some of the, um, so, so the two biggest sites that I can tell you to go to that do all the things are Monarch Joint Venture has the education outreach, they have the trainings, they have things that you can do with citizen science, Monarch Watch, and um, um, Journey North. 
Those are the top three. Okay. So these are some of the eggs from, from our garden. So this is from, from my simple camera. But so we planted milkweed, so now the eggs are coming. So monarchs lay eggs one at a time, one to 300 eggs. Only 5% survive to adults. So that's not the best of all. They're natural predators. So spiders, ants, wasps. Um, and you have some other things happening, parasites and parasites. And those are things that are, are naturally happening in the OE disease. Um, you know, I just know a little bit about it, but um, that's affecting them when they're in their when they're in their pupa state, um, and it's like before they emerge as a butterfly. So there's just some things they're up against, and where they can lay eggs. So this is um, they can lay eggs on the flower of the plant, on the top of the on the top of the milkweed, below the milkweed. Um, so I go out there with groups well, every, every time I can. And, and so I get the kids out there and adults and uh, we get our magnifying glasses and we get and we do surveys and basically I mean, you, you can even do I spy. But this one is on the milkweed pod. And I was so excited. So right there, um, you just got to look really close. Now, this one, you can see all the competition. This is the egg. And those are all the aphids on the plant. That you can see. OK, so more uh, um, egg photos of mine, which I'm um, but this one. OK, they take three to five days to to emerge from the egg. And uh, they're they're not the typical colors yet of the monarch um, caterpillar, but black and white. So this one looks a little bit more black. You can see where this one probably has a couple more days. OK, just the sizes real quick. So um, so this little so I see that one. So this is this guy uh, blown up. So this is probably maybe a day or two right out of that eggshell. And they're going to eat through the eggshell as there's nutrients and keep on growing. So um, they're probably the first instar. So now there's a program with Monarch Joint Venture where you can actually measure the instars. So this is called a first instar when they're this small uh, and measure. This is the size in millimeters. Um, but another survey we can do. So we get into all this, we're ready. So if you plant the milkweed, you're ready. You know right when the eggs are. You check them every day. Now you're... You're looking. Um, and so now some of us, I think for years, I went without ever seeing all this um, and I just saw the larger ones. So now I'm ready, game on. So, um, so this is the NSTAR. And again, if you would if you would do a survey for Monarch Joint Venture, they would train you and help you identify all this, but it's the size of the Monarch um, and, and why they're growing so fast. They grow at a hundred times. So we do not grow like that. Um, but to give an example, they molt every time so they shed their extra skeleton and they eat right through them. So I so we got to watch all of this last year and, and a video coming up will show you that. Um, and it just splits the skin. So I, I tell the kids um you know it's it's like the incredible hawk or the she hawk just just splitting they're gonna eat nonstop because they need all that energy and then they're gonna split through that. Um, and then um, School kids, I, I give an example with so us, it could be college. Uh, first day of college, you're the same size. At the end of the school year, probably a full entire year, you'd be the size of a school bus. So that's how quickly. <laughs> so some of the kids like that. Yeah. So these are all the stages in between. So you could start with the teeny ones. And when it's fully, fully grown, it's probably about two and a half inches. And you start looking at, at, at your milkweed. You can see holes in it. So that's another indicator of, oh, what's going on here? So I love to look for, for signs of the monarchs, um, but the toxic, so that, that's its protection. So it can digest milkweed, which is a which is poisonous to um, a lot of their predators. Um, and, uh, and, they'll, and they'll keep that toxicity um, even when they're adult. Okay, so when they, um, J cradle, um, and then, they can they can hang a, a J cradle on the on the host plant, or they can go um, like if you have a lawn and in our nature center, they can hang, they hang a J cradle on the side of the nature center, um, on the fence post, anywhere. Um, but this little video here will show you shedding. So this is breaking through its last skin. So its fifth mole will just pop off here in a minute.
There, when they all saw that, that's that, that's good enough. But that that stage before it, it's it's going to be another two weeks, so it's going to be thirty five days in the egg. Which will round out about two two weeks to become that two and a half inch caterpillar. Now, in the chrysalis, we'll move on to um, the chrysalis two weeks. So, again, that's where they get that around about a month. So, these are chrysalises at the Cayman. Oh, there's one right there, too. And then I did, I did rear some this year because this was our first year of doing that. And then we were able to take those into the schools. We were able to um, let them see the emergence or, or a closing out of there and then tag them with the school. So, so we're going to get to the tagging coming up here. But this one, this was a, so I always like to look really good. Um, this was a plant, several, several good feet across the garden, but it's not the one here. <laughs> so this is pretty cool. So this is how you can see. So it is attaching it. It's bottom to the top, spinning it in, and its head is towards the end. Uh, so we just sort of saw that. We'll click again. And so that last week is, so that's like a two week time frame right here. So um, you're, 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 you're changing body parts. And then towards the very end, you're, you're, you're able to see this is really neat because um, it takes a good several minutes, if not 10 minutes or 15 minutes or more for them to dry their wings and to pump a lot of that blue litter, all that out. And it's just so I mean, it is, it is. And uh, yes, it is, it's very fun and yeah. So this one has already dried its wings. And then I have a picture over here. I don't like to check out this table, but just looking at what they were Christmas and how small the wings have to be. So this one, these wings just have come out. And if we double click on that, it'll just a little bit bigger. Yeah. And a, spe a special vis um, visitors in the background that that's Alan. Um, Alan Miller, buddy. <laughs> another another seasonal naturalist at the Cape and is in the crown tonight. <laughs> so looking at how crumpled up those wings are. That's and so we would time this and we would check on our chrysalises every every 15 minutes or so. And when they're that dark color, you know that it's you can time this. And we have a we have a monarch journal that 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 we're keeping that on. So yeah, we really miss them by a minute. And sometimes it can be a minute, and we and we run back to the office, and then and then we just, yeah, it's all about timing, timing. So, um, yeah. So now, back to the migration and how how they do this. So this little insect that has never been to the overwintering grounds can do this. Here's a couple little pointers of how that happens. So. That fourth generation, everyone says, how, how do they know when? Well, they're born when it's the tail end of summer, shorter days, shorter nights. And the biggest thing is that they are born in diapause. And that means, so the first, second, and third generation we we're talking about is the ultimate goal is to mate the eggs and, and, and get that generation back up in numbers. This generation um, is not born with that sexual gene and um, presence, so they're not going to be, be born to, to mate. So they know that they just happen to that's not happening. They're going to fuel up and they're going to start start catching wind current and heading south. Uh, so how do they do that? So they have a built-in sun clock and they're actually able to follow the sun with the horizon um, and be able to follow that and commute that in a, in a journey southbound. And then on cloudy days, um, so, so, so reading about that, a magnetic compass. So, and with their eyes, they can see the UV light. So with that, with the magnetic compass, to follow the first magnetic field. So this just is um, some stuff I don't truly you know, understand. I just scratched the surface, but birds, turtles, everyone um, seems to be doing this. And uh, so, so this last part, all this is still a mystery. That's why people love to study this. And there's so many studies over the years that have led us to, just to this point, but um, maybe their sense of smell and, and, their, and their human perception could get them back to the exact mountains. 
Um, another one on there might be mountain ranges. It could, could be a cue of where they're going. But all this is pretty phenomenal because there's millions of monarchs that are meeting up that are going to find just about, there's about nine colonies, and they're going to find these mountaintops, exact mountaintops. So, question. Yeah. I'm going to go on to down the mm. Okay, well, um, we can back up and on that map. So, Florida, they're not going as much. So, this little map um, does show that. So, so, what I've been talking about with Florida, um, I believe that that's a whole non migratory um, insect because, because it's warm all year round. So, they can have the tropical milkweed, they can have that all year round. So, they're not migrating. They shouldn't be mi migrating. Does that mean maybe that could happen? There's all these un unknowns and, and variables. So, so something I learned over here, I did not know nearly as much about the Western migration. So the Western migration um, is coming over here towards the Rockies and then coming back. And we had two volunteers from Pismo Beach, California, which had, um, they, they've been volunteers at the state park there for years and had a wealth of information and I hope, you know, so, um, I was out on the California coast for, for a couple of years and I um, I wasn't into monarchs at the time. So, and I was very close to that site. So, uh, so they've sparked an interest, but, but their monarchs should not be coming down here. And then they were talking about, well, how do they, how do we know they don't go over the Colorado Rockies? Well, you know, that's, that, that could be happening. So we don't know everything, but with GIS and mapping and you know, and monarchs aren't exactly GPS tag. Now there's some new tagging. We haven't got to the tagging quite yet, but um, there's some new things happening in the tagging world. Yeah, I think it has to do with the height of the mountain ranges too, because they don't fly oh, no, 14,000 okay. feet. Uh -huh. That could be. So that's the, an example of, of them being able to follow the sun as they're traveling um, south. So how do we tag monarch? So again, monarch watch. So if you, if you all get on their website, um, monarchwatch.org. They will say all things and they're all things tagging how to order them, when to order them, and you won't have to worry because it'll tell you exactly. I know by reading their information where we are in Berkeley Springs, the latitude or longitude of when we can start tagging. So we can start tagging as of, I believe, the last week of August through September. That's our biggest uh, tagging time. So, how do we tag? All the, there's videos online. There is a lot of good things going on. Online. I had the Monarch Alliance come down and show me years ago how, how to tag. Um, and, and they showed me because you think it's this delicate butterfly, but the more I've learned about the Monarch and how powerful, how strong of, of an insect this is to, to endure the travel to Mexico and back and the weather patterns and, and all things. So if you reared Monarchs or raised Monarchs, you reach in and the easy part uh, is reaching in the net because it's right there. And um, this is pretty cool because you can bring visitors in. So you can tag one and right here on the wing, you, you hold the wings together and this is called the discal cell. Um, and then you have to know on a survey whether it's male or female. So the male is up top there and you can see those two dots and those are the male scent glands. And there's other, there's other um, distinguishing factors, but when sometimes when you have to do a survey or maybe a quick, you know, a quick look that's the easiest way to, to look for those two thoughts. That's the male, the one's a female. Or if you're just out looking at monarchs and you see one nectarine and you want to know, that's the easiest way. So a little bit more about um, tagging and how tagging got started. Yep, yep, you can go. So we didn't know, and who who's we? Like the like all of us in the whole United States did not know where did the monarchs were going until 1975. So Fred, Fred Ur Urquhart and his wife, Nora. So Fred was a zoologist in the, in the Canadian Canada area at a university and has studied these monarchs for 40 years. And so he created the original tagging system. He would, he would tag the wings and just say, replete, um, return to the zoology department um, at, Can at, at, his, at his university in Canada. Uh, so basically, that after studying them for 40 years, they had have an idea. They're, they're heading south and had a good idea the next southern area is going to be Mexico, but they didn't quite know where. So this is a picture of their one of their friends. They had two diplomats or friends in the area, and they had wrote to the papers and were asking people to help 
citizen science. This is what we do all year round, how to help find these. So um, so these uh, two, two of their friends would, would drive around to mountain ranges and this and that, finally, they found them. So um, after 40 years, Fred and Nora got down there in 1975 to see them. And then this National Geographic came out in 1976. So that's when the whole world, now we finally knew. So that's kind of crazy to say, we, we didn't know where they were going until 1975. So we're on the cover again, 2024, but we can owe them now these tracking and now, now they're studying it even more. And now we're just scratching the surface of, of how much they've, we learned up to this point, or at least I am. And so my first tagging experience, um, this is my first tagging experience on the deck of the Nature Center. And this is, uh, you all probably know him, uh, uh, Clark Dixon, who was one of the co-founders of the Potomac Valley Audubon Society. So my dear friend and mentor, which is greatly missed, but these, this photo I couldn't wait to add to um, the presentation because this was a cop monarch and we were tagging for the first time together. So this was one of my first. And, uh, and I, th I think, uh, who here has tagged the monarch? Awesome. And Mark was with me when I Okay, okay. okay. He'll be a couple, comes to our park all the time and helps out and uh, just amazing. Um, so I think you'll never forget your first uh, time tagging. Uh, super funny, you wanna start feeling all the time. <laughs> so here's um so, so, so the tagging system I actually have over here on the table of the 31 marks we tagged so you can see the stickers so after the presentation please pop over here and the, and the sticker is just the I mean about that size so um yeah <laughs> yes so I'm sorry about that so I could elaborate it so so when you order the stickers um so I would order them from the Cape and Resort State Park and put Berkeley Springs West Virginia they know my zip code so on that sticker itself. Um, we'll have, so what do you do if you find it? So it has monarchwatch.org and a number and a, I think four numbers, four letters that would signify that they're, they're your monarchs. And then there's a site that I can go back onto. So, so far, no one's found my 30, our 31 monarchs. Um, that That's all right, because I know that they are out there doing their thing and they've done their thing. Um, but that's how they would find them. So it's not a for sure sign. So I tell people it could it could die the next day by a car. It has to be someone someone to find that. Or it could have made it all the way to Texas and 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 something happened there. But it, it has to find it because it's not that GPS track. So but yeah, that's not fun. So we had a blast with this here. Let, let us play this one first. This is Alan. Alan's <laughs> so this is after he just placed a sticker. And I love it. So we, so again, what a way to, to educate our, our park visitors, our local schools. This was going into the school. We had just released, um, this was a local sixth grade, sixth, sixth grade science class. And I got into about um, all the local middle schools. And uh, some of them, of course, had never tagged a monarch. Um, so they would, they got to name the butter, um, name the butterfly. And uh, this particular one was Chris, I believe. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so it's been it's been very rewarding um, to do all this. So this was the decline question. Uh, so as of last year, they declined fifty nine percent. So here's where we are now, and we haven't been that low since two thousand thirteen fourteen. The good news is, look, we bounced back, and so I feel like a lot of the experts um, are are sharing a lot of information. Like these are resilient insects, and if we do our part, we do our part. Um, of planting those native plants and they're planting our nectaring plants all over from their whole northern breeding grounds from Texas all the way up to Canada. That's our homework. That's our homework. So they are resilient. They're going to bounce back, um, but they need our help. We need our, um, and, I, and I think together we all can do this. So they were down 59%. What's been, they've been down less before. So there's that. And how, how do they measure them? And what's going on? And who does that? So in Mexico, um, all, all the sanctuaries, the ones protected, are in the Monarch Butterfly Biosphere Reserve. So that's made up of like national, federal um, organizations, and they all count. Um, the w, um, WWF is in there too, and they count GIS, the, the overwintering sites, every every December because these butterflies are going to arrive in November, and that's right right near um, the Day of the Dead. 
So asking a lot of the locals and asking some of our local guys, that's a very important day where they honor their their um, relatives that are passed on. And that's right when the monarchs are coming back. So they associate that. Um, you see it, and you'll see some murals coming up with um, some of their ancestral souls coming back to visit for that day. So they so that's a very important holiday for them. Um, but looking at uh, um, how they measure those areas. So these are measured in hectares. So to break that down, 2.7 acres is one hectare. So they have all this map in the, and they're gonna measure the same sites because they're going to the same areas every time. 21.1 um, million butterflies per, he per hectare. And uh, so, so where we are now, this red line up here represents a sustainable goal. So I, I have a, that's a misprint right here, but it's supposed to be six hectares. That, that's their goal. And Mark, our venture working with what they did with that, that's their goal. And then they want to increase that to 1.3 to 1.8 billion milkweed stems. There's not a lot of milkweed in Mexico, we're talking in the, in the northern breeding grounds. So everyone in this grassroots effort of all of us playing those native plants and milkweed. Did you see signs of logging while you were there? No, I didn't. Um, I didn't. So I feel like I, I scratched the surface with um, with where we went. We're going to get to all those photos, but the, the illegal, illegal logging is, is on one of those, and um, they're trying to promote sustainable um, farming because there's some farming that's not going to go with what they're doing. Um, you know, so they're trying to do some mushroom farming and other other um, nursery farming for the oil trees, which we're going to talk about next. But this is the Western Monarch Count. So this year it was 233,000, and what their goal is 500,000. So there's um, so what so over here in the United States we have a lot of teams of people, Monarch Joint Venture, Monarch Alliance. All these nonprofits are being connected with federal agencies, the Fish and Wildlife Service. It's a lot of money to help this. Um, to help this monarch, which is which is definitely declining. I think this September is when everyone is deciding whether it's going to go on the endangered list or not. It was supposed to be sooner, but there's more studies. Uh, so that's not going to be released, I think, until this September. But it's just beautiful to see all these organizations coming together, whether it be National Park Service, state parks, nonprofits all over the country, groups like yourselves, and just people who do care about the monarch coming together. So that's the Western Monarch Count and Goals. And this map is, uh, I have this printed out over here. It's still blurry over here, but this is, this helps me explain um, where we were. So, so Mexico was a state, Mexico was over here in the light green, and then Michoacan is another state. So we got to visit, um, um, so all the protected overwintering sites are, are the nine colonies that are federally protected out of 13. So there's some that are not protected, but they're still surveyed. So this comes from surveying the 13 total. Um, so where, where I was, um, I believe right, right here is one of these, right? This one or this one was um, El Rosario, which is the largest one, and then Sierra Chinqua, right up here. So how did they get that number? This next sheet, and I have this printed out that you all want to look at, because I was curious, how, how did we get that 0 0.900 number? Well, this is all those 13, 14 colonies that they've gone out and surveyed every two weeks starting in late December. They don't want to start until late December, because that's when they're gathering together. Um, November, they're still arriving. So if you looked at all this, that's how they, they tally every year. And usually the counts go out at the end of December or third of January. So these are all, so right here, the U.S. Northern Green Grounds, that's our issues. Um, so human-driven threats, habitat loss, we all um, know about that, and climate change. Um, the reduced monthly abundance due to the high temperatures and droughts. So this last decrease, they said, was a lot due to, the, to, our, to our later summer drought. And when they're migrating to the Texas area, they didn't have a lot of those methane tents. We did the fuel off them. Um, and then well, I guess that last generation, the, the third generation that they were down there, didn't have a lot of milk food. So um, our use of herbicides and farming, um, land use changes, and how that's affecting even our, our, our nectarine plants. So um, all that's going on. So in Mexico, forest degradation, um, legal logging, 
And there are some other solutions what the WWF is trying to do is work with communities um, to alternative jobs for them because those trees are money and they want to um, really, really talk about um, tourism. And I have some numbers coming up here for all the communities from November to March. Um, they up on their, their cooking for people, they have their bed and breakfast, they're, they're touring. So they are getting some um, in, um, the climate change there as well. So this is all, so I wanted to show at least two slides from Mark Joint Venture. So this is their mission um, to protect the monarchs and their migration by collaborating with partners. And then the four big things here, are habitat conservation, education, science, um, and, 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 their, and their partners. So I love to look on here and see all those federal and state nonprofits, uh, Monarch Alliance. If it's not pictured on here, I know you partner with them. And it's just so amazing um, how they keep growing and growing. And then we all team up with them. So um, my goal, my goal is to get our West Virginia State Parks uh, to partner with them, just not to keep them for a whole West Virginia State Park service. So, so here we go. So here's here's the fun part. So we have, if I have until 10 after for a full hour, right? Okay, we can do this in 20 minutes. So this is the fun. So, so getting more into what I wanted to know what's needed in, the, in those northern breeding grounds. So how this connects to overwintering sites. They're, they're not going to get any visitors if we don't do our part of here and vice versa. So um, on Gungeo. So first of all, I flew into Mexico City. So you find it there. And then this is about a three-hour drive up into the mountains of a town on Gungayo, 8,500 feet. So this is one of the most beautiful towns. This is where our tours started from. Probably a lot of different tours are happening from here. Um, so this was the B&B we stayed at. It wasn't really up at breakfast, but this, I mean, beautiful culture. The families cooked for us, um, you know, breakfast and meals. Uh, I got to eat a lot of authentic food, and they're just, they're charming. They're so proud of this modern butterfly. And um, so it's just uh, this amazing people we met along the way. So it starts, this journey starts in the back of a pickup truck. <laughs> so we can play this video up, up, and away. And if we double flip the mic. Yeah, I'm trying to make it larger and it just pauses it. Yeah, okay. Um, right there. I'm sorry. So the views were really the uh, coming up from the stand. <laughs> it could be. So, uh, and the open open bed of the truck. So, from being from West Virginia, I was I felt <laughs> so. There we go. So that's that's the tours. So we finally made it. We are at El Rosario. So the two reserves I went to in El Rosario, which is the largest one, um, and then uh, we'll show the others next. We made it. I could so that made me very happy that that I at least made it from the truck. And I'm, I'm not um, I'm not getting any effects from higher elevation yet. So I'm like, okay, I've got this. And then we move on to beautiful murals are, are all over this town. This was at the entrance. Um, and we have these gators on because we're about to go to horseback next. And uh, it's very dusty trails. <laughs> so this at least has the ramp. So, so, so to go on this trip, they say it's, it's moderate. They don't say it's strenuous, but I, I, was, I was very sore after this trip. I think, I think we hiked about four and a half miles a day under the horse. And, uh, and there's a ramp. But this is up, um, gives you some cool views. Um, we all kind of have a look at this to someone that you didn't have to know how to ride a horse. Give you a feel. We're up on the way here. We've got a couple more videos for you. And there's back on the horse trip. Next one. How far did you go on the horse? Um, I'd say probably about like it was about a couple minute ride or so. And, but it helped to get on the on the ramp and the saddle along and on. But at the next reserve, we had to get all of the set, which was without the ramp and middle part. But again, this was a small group of about 13.
And there might have been another trail of us and people coming up with us too. So we didn't have the reserves um, to ourselves. There were other touring groups, but at one time, our team probably no more than, than double that at a time. So I felt very private. <laughs> oh, <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was learning how to use a GoPro. Should have practiced a little more. And, and this lady right here um, is from the Forest Service, and she's doing a uh, presentation at NCTC here, and um, she already came out in March. She'll be back this summer and invited me out to see her presentation. So this is how all these beautiful connections uh, get together. But but talking about the solid bit of the site, once you get up here, so, so we're about to get up here, So, but it is it feels very almost spiritual as well, very quiet. You're not supposed to be talking a lot. It's supposed to be very soft, awesome. And so next, you're off the horse. And this is when you can feel the oxygen get a little, a little tight. So they, so they equivalent this to like in the Colorado Rockets, <laughs> would be our equivalent. So our, so we had two guides with us at all times. Um, but they on the, on the particular trips when we're hiking, they they would need to carry oxygen tanks um, with us. So, but no one needed those. We had people from youngest would be mid thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, up up to seventies, and uh, we all. I felt like we all made it to the mountaintop and back. We just helped each other, took our time, but nobody needed the oxygen tanks. But you could really feel that. As soon as I got off the horse back, you could really feel it. So I just, they uh, provided hiking poles. So we just hiked very slowly, probably about no more than a half a mile, three fourths of a mile up. So the elevations we're hiking up to are 10,500, 11,000 feet. In. So this is it. So this is me cheating because we made it. And this is the first day. So if everyone can look back there, this is from afar. Um, but this is four to six million monarchs. And they're all hanging in these trees here. Wow, not belong to anybody. But so their groves are hanging from these branches. Some say it's like bees in the store. Um, so we got this one early in the morning. We went twice. The third day we went back, and it was in the later afternoon, and vice versa, because um Different different times of the month. So we'll go ahead. Mm -hmm. So this is take a look at that. Take a look at that. Mm -hmm. And they uh, don't look like very healthy turkeys. Well, mm -hmm. those are the million alpines. Um, so let's go back to that slide and then I have a video of mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, Yeah. And thank you for <laughs> It's hidden sometimes. Oh, there we go. It's silent. And um, sometimes you're our tour guides, you know, you'll see people and, and I have multiple cameras. Uh, they just said, remember to take a time out from your cameras, from your phone, from everything, and just, just sit down or just quiet place and watch. Mm -hmm. So we had time. We I think we spent two to three hours, you know, just, just taking our time and, and it was a feeling of I did not want to leave and, and track down. I just he just wanted to stay a little bit longer. We're going to get it a little bit closer. So thank goodness our guides had packed up on their backs spotting scopes. So we're about to have a couple of close ups. So why is the Ogi male furs and, and then the higher elevation so important to these monarchs? First of all, the Ogi male, there, there's a lot of pine trees um, all over the, these different climates, but up, up in the higher elevations, it's all about the Ogi male furs, and that's the type of pine. So it's perfect for the monarchs because the monarchs, we have to remember, are, are quasi hibernating there. So they're just not there on a resort with all you can eat, uh, milk wheat or anything like that. So they're trying to conserve all those energy. So there's, there's very limited milk. They do have um, nectaring plants at the bottom of 
more more towards the lower elevations which they can get to but it's not but there's not nearly enough for all the millions of monarchs but they have their fat reserves so they are meant to stay cool that's why they've chosen this because it's a sort of a microclimate so they're so far above mexico city would be way too hot and they, they would they would burn through that fat reserve so they were actually looking for a really cool place but not freezing so that's um that's the interesting facts I found out. And the more oil melt trees together, so the more it is just like a blanket of protection. So if it's trying to rain, or if we have so one of those low numbers were from really harsh winter storms in Mexico. So um so it's like a blanket. So it's the oil melt trees are like a blanket. And if you're on the outside, you're exposed, or if there's some illegal logging and you keep getting holes in that blanket, well, that's gonna be more, more. So you saw all those. I remember we're gonna see some more more photos, but the oil melt trees. Um, that's perhaps like their their tree because of because of where it grows and that element. Um, but checking out the nighttime temperature that's just above freezing, but they get up to the 60s. Monarchs can't fly unless it's 55 degrees. There's a lot of factors about all this. So if they float down in the, in the middle of the afternoon, they're just catching a current down, expending very little energy to get warm. Um, I talked about this for years, like I like I could like I could see it, but now I finally can. Um, but they're not, they're just, they're not trying to um, expend any energy. So on the right here is the OML pine cone and the OML um, seeds. What do they do at night? So at, at night, they're going to huddle together. Um, yep, they're going to huddle together. And um, so here's the thing. If the, let's just say the wind picks up or it's and if you get knocked down. Guess what? You can't fly back the next day. So we're going to learn about some predators in the forest and, and, and the bad news about that. Uh, but this photo, okay, we'll play that real quick. So this was the still photo, and this is the live photo. And I just love seeing the two photos side by side. So we can get a feel of what was behind us. But that was our group of 13, our, our, our tribe. And so there we go. So this is a spotting scope. We'll go ahead and... Uh, Get that nice and close and hit play on that. So they're just hanging on to one another. So what they're on here, we're about to see some more pictures. They're they're on the tree trunk. So you can be so they're on a tree trunk. So this and we'll play that video too. Or they're on big roots hanging off the, the branches of the little one. They can even break those branches. So many, but you get a feeling. Um, one of our leaders taught a course in eco spirituality, and it is, um, and so a lot of people do go there to sit, meditate, sit, um, and just take this in. So, so they're on top of one another. Maybe they're trying to get the tree trunk. Um, I don't think that provides any extra heat, but all they're all are the, um, together just because again, they don't want to be flying. Everywhere. Um, they, they want to be preserving that energy, but they need water, so they will go down here. So we'll, we'll get another video coming out. Another shot. Mm -hmm. And then this is from uh, wow. one, one of our group photos. This is not my photo, but he, um, Peter Sanderson has took these gorgeous photos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How long will they stay there? So when they arrive in the, November, stay the whole winter, and they just left mid mid March, mid March, and uh, they're going to start mating here, uh, which I'll, I'll end with a photo of that. Um, I was I was mid mid February start mating in, in mid February, and then they 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 were gone this year by mid mid March. So predators, let's talk about that, and, and we learned about how they get knocked down to the ground or if they. Didn't get back up. So 55 is when they can fly. They can't, their, their, their wings are almost frozen. So this is one of the murals. So three big predators happening out there. So uh, black haired mouse, reading about that. The mouse can hunt one mouse, can hunt 37 butterflies one night. And only the wings remain. So now you all can read this too. We'll just go through it together. So the black backed oriole. So we think of an oriole, it's a very thin beak. And the monarch's um, toxins are mostly in their wings, so they're able to swim up in the abdomen and eat the inside of them. So they actually have a spine scope on this, 
And uh, I um, I couldn't get to it in time. And I had my binoculars for this um, event. I, I don't want to see that, but I wanted to see it. You know, this, this stuff happens. So uh, the, the black headed gross beaks, they have more of a blunt beak. I sort of compare that to a, um, to a cardinal. And so they are going to eat, they're going to chomp the whole body and leave the head. And so at the very bottom here, 15% of the entire population is due to this predation. So um, the adult monarchs here in the Northern breeding ground, we don't have that enhanced as much. There's no other birds that have evolved to, to, to that. So maybe maybe some birds here and there might, might learn trial and error and spit that out, but there's no, we don't have to worry about sort of our adult Northern breeding ground monarchs as much as we do here, here, in, here in Mexico. So now next up is a quiz. Okay, who has eaten the body on the left? And who has eaten the body on the right? Yeah, you didn't know there'd be a quiz. <laughs> you got it. You got it. So the one on the left, where you just see the head, that was the gross beak. Um, and then here, the whole body, that, that would have been the, um, the oracle. So yeah, Alan has that. <laughs> and then here, so so walking up on that half a mile, walking up to the reserves um, or the sanctuaries, you, you can look down and you see all these wings. So I took my time and I tagged 31 monarchs this year. So I'm lucky. I'm lucky, but I did not see any tags. But these are just the wings. So that would have been the mouse. The mouse would have eaten the whole entire body and just leaving the wings. So you'll see where, where people have come and gone before and leave these little piles of wings will go on. Is there toxins in the head? Well, it looks like, um, you know, it looks like they left the head and one ate the whole entire thing. So I feel like there are some, uh, the wings are the most, and without, you know, knowing I, there's all these scientific reports and with me just scratching the surface, you know, finding out how the mouse had the death and there's studies on, on this mouse and now how the mice, there's a particular type of mouse adapting to be able to eat the same body parts in the Western mite migrating area in California. So there's all these studies and uh, so I don't know the full answer to that, but uh, it looks like the mouse can eat it. Maybe the birds can't. So maybe maybe that might tell us there's a little more there. Don't know. I'm not... But as we go down the mountain, so so then we walk um, probably the um, three miles back down, and how, uh, however many, yep, three miles back down, the vegetation changes. So if anyone comes to nectar, um, these are the three predominant plants that were just gorgeous. Um, and the hummingbirds are up next. So on the left over here, this is hard to see, but this is the white eared hummingbird. And over here on the right uh, is the Mexican violet here. And I feel like if we skip this video and go to the next, well, sorry, let's go to the top video and see if we can turn the volume up, please. Okay. Because in the bottom part of the forest, it's always that top one. The top one. You hear, I heard, we all heard nothing but hummingbirds. I thought I was hearing birds, but just so I can hear that. Okay. Yeah. Please, you can pull up this way. I want to pick up on one when you leave. That's a little salt for you guys. Sorry about that. I don't have a, uh, a speaker, but you can pull these two up, um, and it's just just this beautiful forest noise. At the very end of my trip, that's all I heard before we got back there. But beautiful, just beautiful mountain views all around. Thank you. And so we'll back up uh, one, one more. And uh, so this monarch butterfly, Mariposa Monarch. So and these are the beautiful wildflowers that are more of the lower region. This is probably just, just past the of where you enter if you want to walk up for, for walking back. And this video, this is about halfway down the mountain on the second time we went to Rosario. And it just it was a lot warmer. I did not see this the first day. And they just started flying down the mountain. And we, and we I 
Oh my, so we'll just fly through this. Um, not fly, but I could. Um, I'll say I'm going to play you over time. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm just, um, I think I'm going to look now. So, so this is, but these are the best, best of the best and the mysteries and, uh, and the hummingbirds, okay, um, coming back down the mountain. So this is when they're starting to puddle. So um, let's, let's play this video, please. And so I was one of the last ones down, so I missed a lot more um, congregating again. Still amazed with this. And it's just, just some, some water sources that they're starting to, to just land on in their proboscis. What I've learned is it's not like a straw, they're not slurping up, more like a sponge, and they're, mm -hmm. they're absorbing it. But in the mountains where we're at here in the um, transvolcanic, Mountains, Mexico. All, all the water sources are, are coming off the mountains, um, going down towards Mexico City. Yeah. It's so many of them at one time. Before this, I've only seen 20 together at one point, and that was for a monarch, um, monarch joint venture survey. And, I, and I, so I, I told my whole group this the whole time. We got to know each other, and I've only seen 20 monarchs. <laughs> and uh, it was just, it was just amazing. So we can, we'll go on through here, and then I think, I think my next couple pictures will go to a Sierra Chinqua here, here pretty soon. But this is a picture of Christine Sanderson. So the program director, I just happened to luck out and be on her trip. So I feel like we have a, a, lot of, a lot of connections here. I can ask questions as needed and uh, so we can reach out. That's her own the line. So um, again, all these groves here, we're still, we're still in um, a Rosario. Here, we'll just flash some pictures here. Rosario, close up. We already saw the one close up, okay. Let's keep going there. One one butterfly was, was very close here. Times of the day. <laughs> and this was the sunset coming back down before we got so we're back probably nine thousand feet here. And they had a surprise for us. They and they would give us surprises every day. So this one was the sunset. We hadn't had dinner yet. And this was the uh, wine, drink, uh, hors d'oeuvres as we watched the sunset. So I, I would like to show you the video on this one because you're going to love it. Uh, so they, that's, that's a good picture of the truck, but we'll see if we can watch this video. Um, that's on, it's underneath the truck, right? The video? Yep. That, okay. And so to show you the mountain and how steep you were asking about that, but I, I didn't see any volume or anything like that. That's one of our guides there. And they said dress in wonders. So again, it goes down to the, they can get above freezing, but I'd say the 40s and then we got up to the 60s. So they would say dress in layers. So boy, did, boy, did I have to in layers. So next, next sanctuary we're going to be traveling into. Well, and there's um, one photo coming up here. <laughs> So WWF and um, and replanting the OEML trees. So this is what they're trying to do is, is an effort there is they're replant the OEML trees and, and keep growing them and start growing them for to replace the others. 
So this is what the WWF is specifically doing. And I just, I'm just scratching the surface on what they're doing. We could spend another um, great detail of time looking at specific projects. But in Mexico, that's what they're doing. And uh, they're doing these lovely tours, but they're teaming up with sustainable farming, which the mushroom farms and the tree nurseries tend to be, I guess, on the top end. Ecotours, um, ecotours and revenue, a uh, quarter million visitors each year. So that's a lot of tourism money, which I felt this trip um, supported, and uh, I felt really good about that. Um, and the and then the bottom um, again is what they're teaming up with farmers. So it's, it's basically all about educating in these groups. Whoever you are, it's educating. There's people that outreach to our farmers. There's far, there's farming groups um, that are that are they're taking a stance and allowing them to be on their farms. It's all about spreading that word. Um, and, get, and getting it out there, what's needed to sustain this this multi generational migration? Because we are in jeopardy of losing it. If we keep doing our part, we'll be able to to keep it. So Sierra um, Sierra Chinko, three hundred thousand to four hundred fifty thousand monarchs. And here's a new view of monarchs for you. So this was the grove up there. And we can save some of these videos. Um, Let's go down. I'm going to show you the spotting scope one, which is just too cool. So this one right here, uh, it's going to show you um, where we're looking at with and without the scope. That's just good. Give you a on that. And then we're coming back down the mountain. Um, these are the um, baby monarchs on the way down. And these are the uh, authentic mountain guides of, 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 of local guides in the area. So even if you're a uh, company like us or anywhere, you have to have a guide with you to go up into these special sanctuaries. And uh, beautiful murals in the town of Antangueo. Uh, and then their, their $100 um, bill here has, has the models. A beautiful. Um, Alomas is another word for the monarchs right there. They've got Fred Urquhart and the National Geographic and this whole town. And uh, that now relies on the, on the, on the forest of the monarchs. At the group photo, we're, we're coming down off the mountain now in the Valley de Bravo. That's where a lot of, um, that's uh, some of the rich tourist de destinations, what I've heard. Uh, now we're coming out of the mountains and uh, in, into this area. And next up is a cute little waterfall we're coming down. We're having all this beautiful meal together. Um, and we'll keep going here. Uh, and this was a botanical garden in Toluca, Mexico. And uh, this is, I think, one of the largest stained, stained glass um, structures, not not churches, but uh, and it depicted human human evolution with with, with day and night. So this, this this thing was phenomenal. So um, yeah, if you're, if you're ever there, take it. So now we're back on what's happening here. The milkweed's popping up. We're getting ready. And if you ever want to know where exactly the monarchs are and to, to jump on board, this is Journey North. Um, so anytime you all see a monarch, it can be an adult monarch. Um, an egg, a larval. This is telling me the first um, um, see the monarch sightings. I don't. That's hard to believe in the top corner, but 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 we are going up now, and we'll keep going. And, and there's another egg one. But I have a, an account in Pickapen. Whenever I see an egg, a larva, any stage, or a monarch, I can have this downloaded on my phone. So even if you see an adult monarch, it's a way that citizen science, just, just like the purple hearts were doing, we're still doing it to, to find out how, how, how and where they are. So that is about wrapping it up and leaving you with, um, you know, you know, coming out here, share this with a friend. You all are doing the part because you showed up here tonight to, to, to join me for this and I thank you. Uh, but all these sites, I mean, if you have land, uh, land, um, I know, I know you do here. So he's playing with um, NRCS, <laughs> and there's land grants to plant monarch way stations or plant by the acres. I'm teaming up in Mineral County to do that too. Um, our West West Virginia State Park Service is doing um, um, wild wild yard certifications. So that's pretty neat to look into if, if you all want to get into that. 
Um, another another favorite author and a really cool concept is uh, Doug Tallamy, Homegrown National Park. Um, it's about this grassroots effort, which we're all taking on, I believe, is, is doing your part, growing some milkweed, growing this in our own backyards um, and, and making sure we do that in the Northern Breeding Ground. So what I walked away with from the trip is um, watching the beauty, I feel, of this, of, of the monarch representing um, hope, representing um, togetherness, because what I saw, because of it is bringing borders together. It's bringing states. It's bringing uh, countries together because Canada has to work with us, the United States and Mexico, to make sure all the different areas are protected. We can't do an inspection up here without the Mexico government doing their part too. So I'm just scratching the surface, but but what I saw from a standpoint is all these beautiful people, beautiful friendships, beautiful working relationships, all on this monarch, bringing us together. And there's so much division out there and all of us fighting the good fight uh, together. And you all can make a difference. We can. And uh, I'm gonna thank you for coming out. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. No, that's there, there are some perspectives from the Monarch Alliance if you, anybody's interested. Right. And there is a card back there that pretty much shows you what a Monarch way station Awesome. And I also wanted to thank Dana Fogel for coming out. And she's one of our board members and she brought the refreshments today. So oh, thank, thank you so you. much, Dana. See you guys next time. <laughs> Yeah, they, like these two guys are in the table and make sure that they're